We've talked about a lot, Ashley, but I want to talk about a looming threat I think a lot of us are aware of, and that's China, the Chinese Communist Party, also known as the CCP. One of the things we talk about a lot up here in Alaska is mining our critical earth and rare earth minerals. Um, we have a lot of them up here. Unfortunately, we're not allowed to access much of it. Uh, but China's doing a great job of that. And under our administration policies right now, we're really dependent on them. I read on one of the Institute's fact sheets that China accounts for 70 percent of global mining and 85 percent of our refining capacity. Of course, we're dependent on all this for like our electronics, our manufacturing, um, everything that goes into our uh, electronic electric cars where we want to go with renewable energy. So if they ever decide to withhold that from us, we're, you know, in a, a world of trouble. How do we successfully challenge the global mining dominance in China, reverse our dependence on them for rare earth minerals, uh, get back to using the resources we have here, or at least maybe going to allied countries for it? What would you say is a solution in mining? Well, the first thing that just is kind of common sense, in my opinion, is how have we allowed our top adversary to have so much control over every aspect of our lives? Um, and I think about it in terms of reciprocity. Like, there's no way that we would ever allow China to do, or China would allow us to do in China what they're allowed to do here. We've given them control of mining markets. We've given them control of national security. We've given them control of American agricultural land. We've given them control of technology. We've given them control of higher universities, higher ed. Um, with their uh, different uh, programs, they're allowed to come into the universities and are funded by our tax dollars. And so at some point, we need to ask our government officials, where's the reciprocity? And if there's no reciprocity, stop doing it, because America should be first always, period. Um, and that's really going to take a grassroots movement, in my opinion. Yeah, that was really well said. Yeah, I mean, along those lines, Ashley, I mean, you referenced the agricultural lands, something that the America uh, First Policy Institute put out that I had no idea about, and I think a lot of Americans don't, is that is how much agricultural land China has purchased between 2010 and 2020, how much it's, it's gobbled up. It went from owning about 13,720 acres of agricultural land around 2010 to increasing its holdings to 352,000 140 acres of agricultural land. And of course, that's this, enormous. That's it's huge. It's like 25 times more or something in, in 10 years. And of course, I think this goes to China's food security strategies, right? That the more they can control the the, the food security chain, that's another way of uh, basically weaponizing food against its adversaries. And yet we're letting them do that. Why? Yeah. Well, and it's not just the land that they're owning. They own some of the manufacturing plants for our food and in America. And that's crazy that we would allow that because you know what? They would never let us do that in China. Um, and we've just ceded so much control to them that it's made our country completely unsafe. And if you remember during COVID, when we had a, a shortage of the masks and we had a shortage mm -hmm. of the ventilators, we had to we had to kick into gear. And I think the former administration did a good job of making sure that you know we were resourceful. But imagine if there were another you know global pandemic. Are we fully prepared since we are now four years out from that? And in my opinion, significantly worse off in terms of our our energy production, in terms of our manufacturing, in terms of all of these other things. It's a huge crisis that we're facing. Um, and quite frankly, it really irritates me that China has never, ever been held accountable for the COVID-19 pandemic that completely destroyed people's lives. Mm -hmm. Yeah, all around the world. And it sounds like what you're saying and the big takeaway is ultimately the responsibility here lies on the shoulders of elected leaders and then people appointed by them. Um, I heard you loud and clear. Um, why did we give them so much control? And then on the flip side, they're not giving us that kind of access into their their operations, into their world. This is intentional. It's intentional on our part. And then to your question, Nikki, um, it was intentional on China's part to do all those land grabs. And we're allowing it. And so if we want to see a change, 
we have to be the change. We have to choose to reverse policies. We have to choose to hold them accountable. When I was on the campaign trail, people were asking me, well, what would what would you do on the national debt? I said, well, first I would erase the debt that we owe to China because for the accountability, like you at least cost us what we owe you because of COVID. And so there, yeah. that took care of a lot of it right there. And now, now we've started. And I would consistently get, regardless of polit- people's political affiliations, the head nods, because we haven't had any kind of, as you would say, um, the accountability for that, any kind of recognition of what it cost everybody, especially the people who lost family members and loved ones. But we have to do something. And that takes me to another question, which is kind of what this show's audience is about. What do we do? We want to be the people who are courageous enough to stand and do something. Um, People who can be mobilized, are bold and courageous enough to stand for the truth, stick by our values and beliefs, even if it's something as small as showing up to vote or not purchasing something to signal with our dollars and our wallet what we stand for. Um, We're not elected policy leaders. We're not sitting in the halls of Congress. But surely there's stuff that we can do because when everybody teams together, it makes a difference. So what would you say are things that people watching and listening to the show can do to really advance America first in a policy position? And we we really want this to be the way our country goes. Yeah, it's been really interesting. This year, I had the privilege of being able to travel to about 28 cities across the country um, advocating for America first policies. And I came across so many people who said, you know, how do we get our government officials to do fill in the blank? And I think as a country, as you know, moms and dads and grandparents and aunts and uncles and business owners and teachers and doctors and whatever, whatever, however you identify, we forget that the power belongs to us. It doesn't belong to government. It doesn't belong to the unelected or the elected bureaucrats in the Washington DC swamp. It belongs to the people. That is how it is intended. And so there is nothing that you can do that is too small. It could be, you know, putting a a post on Facebook. It could be registering to vote, registering your neighbor to vote, driving your friends to the polls. It could be writing a letter to your legislator. Um, It could be going to a school board meeting or, you know, submitting submitting a records request to find out what's actually happening at the school board meetings or happening in your school districts. Um, America First Policy has a whole list of different toolkits on ways to get involved on their website. With us, you can sign up at AmericaFirstWorks.com, and we would love to be able to share with you different ideas to um, contact your legislators or just be vocal. But I'll tell you one thing that um, I heard a sermon a couple weeks ago, and um, it was really about our, our moral values. And one thing that we know is in the Bible, like there's morality and there's not morality. And someone can ask you, you know, what time is it? And you don't say, well, I know what time it is, but I don't know what your interpretation of time is. Hmm. No, like, you know what time it is. And so for us, like, we know what is moral and we know what is right. And we have an obligation to speak up, especially for those who aren't able to speak up. And so I would just say, root yourself in faith, pray, pray for America, pray for your community and any little thing you can do. There's nothing too small um, that won't help America. Hmm. I think that's such a powerful way to put it, you know, and it reminds us that this is about we the people. That's right. Not we the bureaucrats. Right. We the people. And the American people, I think, are beginning to come alive to the reality that, yes, they're not um, helpless, that that there is something they can do. And just these practical tidbits that you're giving of just little things that can make a big difference are what yeah. we need to do at the grassroots level. This is what I'm hearing, like across cities, states, and communities. And it's not just for a party at the end of the day, it's for all yeah. of us. The point is, America first works. <laughs> yeah. that, that The emphasis on, on, on works, and it works for everybody. What we're experiencing right now is only working for a very narrow few <laughs> who right. are you know, basically exploiting uh, the people of this country, and it's not okay. And so I just wanted to thank you, Ashley, for your courage, for your conviction, for um, everybody who's associated with you at America First Works and the America First Policy Institute um, in leading that charge. And 
showing us, uh, the grassroots folks, that there's a lot of things that we can do uh, to participate in a renaissance, if you will, of uh, yeah. of our country. I, I've, I've said this on other shows, you know, we people will talk about make America great again. I think right now we, we need to start by making America America again and, yeah. and, and continue building uh, from there. So anyway, thank you. Yeah, I really yeah. appreciate that. Um, the The idea that we have to take ownership in this and do what we can do. And one of the things that I love to help people with this kind of provide insight into how government works. Um, so not everything has the same level of effect in government. If you want to have maximum effect, go sit in the person's office. Everybody yeah. has to go to the bathroom. And so they will exit their office at some point. And if you're sitting there, you can intersect them even without an appointment because they won't always give you an appointment, right? But everybody right. has to get up at some point. And so a personal meeting is more effective than a phone call, but phone calls are also more effective because you're in person than a, a letter, but letters are effective because there's document retention rules. And so they, you, they have to respond to and keep letters than an email, which can easily just get filtered to junk mail or trash. So if you want to have maximum effectiveness, actually get involved in person.